Hey everyone, welcome back to Lab Coats. Alright, picture yourself going to the movies. What's the first thing you think of? Some might imagine the candy, or maybe just the immense feeling of disappointment they got from watching any of the recent Marvel or Disney movies. Me though, I think of the popcorn. I don't really know how it is in other countries, but here in the good old USA, if a movie theater doesn't reek of buttery popcorn, it's probably abandoned. It's a pretty iconic smell. A smell that, interestingly, doesn't seem to match actual butter. And that begs the question, what kind of delicious lie has Big Popcorn been feeding us? As it turns out, the stuff covering our popcorn isn't actually butter. It's a mixture of oil, beta carotene, and a cocktail flavoring agents that contains a fairly high concentration of this particular molecule, diacetyl. Diacetyl contributes heavily to the taste and smell of natural butter, so it is often added to fake butters like margarine to help them better match the real deal. However, its reputation has been somewhat damaged thanks to certain inhalable products that incorporate it. Despite being a remarkably safe natural food additive, plenty of people seem to actively avoid it because it can cause lung damage when inhaled in unnaturally large amounts. So, to help clear its name, I decided to synthesize some diacetyl for myself and then try using it to make some fake butter for my popcorn. Now, before I get started doing that, I feel like I should probably go ahead and talk about safety. Tasting homemade chemicals is not something I recommend anybody try. It just isn't smart. I only did what I'm about to show because my product was heavily diluted. So much so that it wouldn't have hurt me even if it was cyanide. We're talking under one milligram here. Still, play it safe and don't replicate what you're about to see me do. And while we're on the subject of safety, did you know that you might not be safe browsing the web? It's true. There are a lot of common cybersecurity threats out there these days. You could mistakenly download malware instead of your favorite software, log into a fake Wi-Fi network on accident, or even get fish into paying bills that never actually existed. Having been scammed before, I know just how much this sucks, which is why I'm super excited to partner with NordVPN for this video. NordVPN is a virtual private network that helps protect you online by encrypting your data and hiding your IP address, which makes searching the internet a whole lot safer. I've been using Nord for about a month now, and personally, I'm really impressed with it. The installation was super easy, and it was basically ready to go. All I really had to do was select which network I wanted to connect with. Looking a bit deeper, NordVPN also has dark web protection to help keep track of your sensitive information, as well as anti-malware and browsing protection to help stop phishing, viruses, and all sorts of other nasty stuff. Oh, maybe I should look into that. Best of all, Nord also blocks ads even on sites like YouTube. I'm no genius, but I'm pretty sure most people hate being forced to sit through fake commercials like this. Drink a glass of water before bed to lose 50 pounds and reverse type 2 forever. Thankfully, if you get NordVPN using my link below, you don't have to. Go to nordvpn.com labcoats and you'll receive four extra months on top of their two-year plan, or three extra months on the one-year plan. And if you don't like the product, you can get your money back risk-free within 30 days of purchasing thanks to Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash labcoats for Nord's best deals on their excellent VPN services. Alright, to make diacetyl, I utilize the following reagents. Sodium nitrite, ethanol, sulfuric and hydrochloric acids, dichloromethane, and methyl ethyl ketone, otherwise known as MEK. As usual, I got most of these chemicals off Amazon, but the sodium nitrite was a bit trickier due to recent restrictions on more popular websites. It's not illegal by any means, but I did have to buy it off a special site that sells it for curing fish eggs. Now, according to the paper I decided to follow, the first step to making artificial butter flavor was setting up a noxious gas generator, as one does. For this, I filled a small flask with 62 grams of sodium nitrite, which was mixed with 28 milliliters of ethanol. Some nitrite dissolved, but the vast majority remained untouched. Then, I connected a pressure equalized addition funnel, which was filled with sulfuric acid, and topped it off with a hose adapter. The point of this apparatus was to generate a gas called ethyl nitrite, which is colorless, flammable, and can be toxic if inhaled. Hence why I decided to work in my fume hood. Ethyl nitrite isn't strictly necessary though, and I really only used it because the paper told me to. The process works almost identically with isopropyl nitrite, which is far easier to make and handle, and apparently, regular sodium nitrite will also do the trick. Regardless, the nitrite is only half the story here. The other half is what goes into this three-necked flask. 
50 milliliters of methyl ethyl ketone mixed with 4 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Now, looking at the molecular structure of MEK, you can see that it's actually pretty close to our target compound. The only piece that's missing is this carbonyl group, which is where the nitrite comes in. Under acidic conditions, the ethyl nitrite dissociates into ethanol and nitrosonium ions, while the ketone enolizes to form, well, an enol. Nitrosonium readily attacks the nucleophilic double bond on the enol, forming this intermediate which quickly tautomerizes into diacetyl monoxime. And to complete the reaction, excess hydrochloric acid is added to hydrolyze the monoxime into diacetyl. To actually run this reaction, I directed the gas generator's outlet into the MEK solution with a glass tube. Then, I hooked up an adapter for my digital thermometer, and a condenser to help stop vapor from escaping. The whole setup was then placed onto a hot plate with strong stirring, and gently warmed to 40 degrees Celsius. Once this temperature was reached, the stopcock was carefully opened, and the sulfuric acid was slowly dripped onto the nitrite solution. Almost immediately, a bunch of ethyl nitrite vapor was formed, which began to bubble through the ketone. This caused a rather substantial spike in temperature, so I cut the heat and placed the flask into a water bath. The target temperature for this reaction is between 40 and 55 degrees Celsius, which meant that I had to adjust the sulfuric acid drip rate accordingly to prevent overheating. After some time, the solution began to shift from colorless to straw yellow, and eventually, once all the sulfuric acid had been added, I was left with this vibrant banana yellow solution. In theory, this should have been a solution of diacetyl monoxime, which is supposed to be a colorless solid. Thanks to the hydrochloric acid catalyst, though, some of the monoxime ended up prematurely transforming into diacetyl, which is naturally bright yellow. At the time, I figured this was no big deal, since diacetyl is what I wanted anyway. But that was a bit of a mistake. According to the paper, I next had to distill off the ethanol that formed from the ethyl nitrite. But when I tried to do this, the solution started to grow darker. And darker. And darker. The distillate was also bright yellow, suggesting that a decent amount of diacetyl was coming over. This told me that the hydrochloric acid was having a much greater effect than the paper had implied, and that it was not only breaking down the monoxime into diacetyl, but probably also catalyzing some kind of aldol polymerization reaction between the ketones. I was originally hoping to isolate the monoxime, but since that didn't seem very likely anymore, I decided to simply add the final portion of acid and distill the diacetyl off directly. Pure diacetyl boils at roughly 88 degrees Celsius, so I kept distilling until I passed this temperature. The resulting solution definitely contained diacetyl, based on the smell, but it also had a decent amount of acid, ethanol, and MEK mixed in. So for the next step, I had to purify it. To do this, I neutralized the solution with saturated sodium bicarbonate, and attempted to distill off the unwanted material. Unfortunately, this led to even more polymerization, and with all the distillate being yellow once again, I was forced to acknowledge a rather frustrating fact about diacetyl. It forms an azeotrope with ethanol. If I had used less acid and properly isolated the diacetyl monoxime before hydrolyzing it, this wouldn't have been an issue. But now, there really wasn't an easy way to purify my product. So, in an attempt to at least isolate the organic material from the water, I performed a few extractions with dichloromethane. This seemed to work fairly well, and after fractionally distilling off all the DCM, I was thankfully left with a few pitiful milliliters of ethanol diacetyl azeotrope. Now, what would I change if I did this again? Well, pretty much everything. But mainly, I would use isopropyl nitrite instead of ethyl nitrite, and neutralize the acid catalyst before distilling off the alcohol and isolating the monoxime. I do wish that I would gotten more diacetyl, but at the end of the day, I still came out with way more than I needed to make my fake butter. Now, looking for a recipe, I couldn't find any information on the movie theater stuff. But I did find this paper that told me the diacetyl content of a much more common butter substitute, margarine. Here, the maximum concentration was found to be right around 3 mg per 100 grams of margarine, or 0.003% by weight. Not really that much. Popcorn butter might have a lot more, but I'd be willing to bet that's still below a thousandth of the oil's total weight. So, following this course of logic, with a bit of guesswork, I used about half a milliliter. This was added to 100 grams of non-flavored popcorn oil, and since it was the 50% azeotrope, I was left with a solution containing roughly 0.25% diacetyl, over 80 times more than the strongest margarine, and 50,000 times more than regular butter. Oh, and strong enough to make my whole house smell like a movie theater. Let's make some popcorn with it. Now, for those who only get their popcorn fix from a bag, this is how one obtains unflavored popcorn. 
you get it from the same aisle at Walmart and throw it into either a pan or an air popper. I already own this old air popper, so that's what I used. If you've never owned one of these before, I actually recommend grabbing yourself one. They're a lot of fun and only make a small mess of your countertop. Once all my unflavored popcorn had been popped, I loaded up two separate bowls. One bowl served as the control and it was doused in the regular unflavored oil, while a second bowl received the fake butter treatment. And with that and a pinch of salt, it was time to see if I had succeeded or just ruined a bunch of popcorn. All right, got the two different popcorns here. Got the one here made from just plain old Orville Redenbacher popping and topping oil. I tasted this by itself. It's a fairly neutral flavored oil. It doesn't really taste like anything. I mean, I don't even think it really has any, uh, well, it says artificial flavor, but it just tastes like oil. It doesn't really taste like popcorn butter or anything like that. And on this one here, got the mixed up diacetyl popcorn topping I made. Basically, I just took 100 milliliters of this and added, I think it was 0.5 milliliters of the diacetyl. Yeah, let's cut to the chase. Let's taste some popcorn. I sprinkled a little bit of salt on both of these just to kind of, I don't know. It's what you're supposed to do with popcorn. Come on, you have to add salt. Hmm. It doesn't really taste like a whole lot. Kind of like I said, it's, it's a neutral flavored oil. It doesn't really add a whole lot of flavor to this. It kind of just imparts this smooth mouthfeel, I guess, what you'd call it. Just because it's an oil, but yeah, other than that, I can really just taste the salt and that kind of mild popcorn flavor, I guess. Nothing to really write home about. This, on the other hand, is a completely different story. From here, I can smell the... Yeah, it smells like a microwavable popcorn or, I guess, movie theater popcorn. It smells like that fake buttery smell. So, let's see what it tastes like. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That's a night and day difference. I was not expecting it to be that pronounced. I could have gotten away with half or less of that amount. Wow, that is intense. I'm going to be honest, I wasn't expecting this traumatic of a result. I actually tested this oil, the oil that I made, on like just some crackers or something earlier, just to see if I could detect the butteriness. And I wasn't too impressed, but putting this on popcorn, which by itself really doesn't have a lot of flavor, it really pops. <laughs> it's not like a perfect butter flavor. It's really close, but it's not perfect, obviously. In fake butter flavor, they obviously add a few other little ingredients here and there to make it taste more like the real deal. But yeah, if you were to give me that and tell me it's movie theater popcorn, I would totally believe you. There's, there's not a lot of difference there. That is, wow, that's surprising. That's pretty, that's impressive. All right, so that went even better than I was expecting. I honestly had my doubts going into this project, mostly because I had tried and failed to make diacetyl before. Regardless, I'm super happy to have finally achieved at least some success. If you want to see it done even better though, go check out Amateur Chemistry's video. He used sodium nitrite directly and got way better yields in the end. And if you want to help support my channel and get your own sample of official Lab Coats Fake Butter, just donate $15 or more using the PayPal link in the video description. I'll send you a small vial of the exact oil I put in my popcorn, and you'll be helping me crank out even cooler videos, like my next one, which will be covering how to make fluorine gas. And yes, new $15 Patreon members will also be offered a sample. Keep in mind though, this is meant to be more of a collector's piece and not really something for you to eat. Although, if you do want to taste it, I suppose I can't really stop you. Oh, and I can't really ship outside of the US. Believe me, I've tried. So, sorry non-American donors. As usual, I'd like to thank all my existing supporters on Patreon. Videos like this take a lot of effort to make, and I probably wouldn't be doing so without your donations. 
Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats out.